One, two. Said I'm not Anglo-Saxon. Got me the freezing mail. Ain't no Anglo-Saxon. Got me the freezing man. I'm an amateur historian. My name is Gerald Capon. I've written a book called The Frisian Enigma. In this book, I prove, quite conclusively I think, that the people that live in England aren't of Anglo-Saxon origin, and for that matter, they don't speak an Anglo-Saxon language. This whole project started in the summer of 2009 with a tourist trip with my wife, Mary, and my dog, Roxy to an island called Rumu off the southwest coast of Jutland in Denmark. As you will see, this led me indirectly to start writing this book. Well, here we are in June of 2009, crossing the causeway to the island of Rumu. We're about halfway across. It's about 10 kilometers long. On your left, you can see the island fuzzily in the distance. We are in the middle of what is called the Wadden Sea. We spent a week on Rumu, living in a dune environment on that island. The dune environment is so important to our story later on. We love the beaches, they're so enormous and gigantic. And yes, when I'd left, Rumu had given me the idea to write this book. If what I've written in this book is true, and I believe that there is irrefutable evidence that our history of British antiquity and the Anglo-Saxon invasions, as it is written, is incomplete at best and totally wrong at worst. I started this project aged 60 and proving this has become a major task for me for the last few years. Basically, what I'm proposing is that in England we aren't Anglo-Saxons and for that matter we don't even speak an Anglo-Saxon language. To support what I've written and to confirm my arguments I've put together a lot of bibliography. This I will show you as we go on. I've drawn the facts I've used from many sources in different languages from both sides of the English Channel. They were in English, French, Latin, German, Dutch and in Frisian. However, before starting I would like to list five authors whose books have profoundly influenced my thinking about this period of British history. Their collective works have pushed the accepted ideas of British history for the period from the late Iron Age, circa 150 BC, until the Viking raids and eventual invasion starting late 8th century AD to the brink of the rubbish bin. I hope that this book will help to give these already tottering current historical tenets for the period of the English Dark Ages the last shove into long-deserved oblivion. The first of five authors was the famous historical TV presenter Michael Wood. It was his 1986 work, Doomsday, A Search for the Roots of England, which first brought my attention to the possibility of continuum in land occupation from pre-Roman times to well beyond the end of the Dark Ages. I bought the book Remaindered in a discount bookshop in Chiswick High Road on a visit there in 1988, proving that some radical changes in ideas are quite often ignored. The second of the five authors is Stephen Oppenheimer. He came to my attention with his book Eden in the East, which I bought at the airport on the way to the US. From the cover and reviews, I fancy it being a book to while away the time peacefully on the long flight. It seemed from the cover to be a little bit like the chariots of the gods. I could not have been further from the truth. His reasoned arguments for a drowned civilization, predating by thousands of years both the Mesopotamian and Egyptian civilizations, are very convincing. Today, this conjectured modern society is 30 metres underwater due to the rising sea levels at the end of the last ice age. Dr Oppenheimer indicates that this civilization was located between the Indonesian islands on a now drowned large plain of the continental shelf. His book really has the ring of truth. Further, his groundbreaking work in using genetic analysis to trace the movements of peoples has opened a new vista on the way we look at history. His book, The Origins of the British, applies the same genetic analysis methods to the origins of the people in the British Isles. 
with some astonishing results that really upset the apple cart of British history. The third of the five authors is Dr. Francis Pryor. Two of his works, Britain BC and Britain AD, are gigantic spanners thrown into the works of accepted history from the Stone Age to the Norman invasion. They have helped me understand that invasions are rarely the replacement of one people by another, and that even after invasions, people at the bottom of the pile stay the same. This continuity in communities, which Francis Pryor describes so well, can be measured today genetically. The fourth author of the five is Sir Barry Cunliffe. His book, Iron Age Communities in Britain, helped me to comprehend the changes that occurred from the Stone Age through the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. I understood from his book that the spread of important technologies was sometimes accompanied by migration of peoples to Britain. He shows that this was the case with the arrival of the Belgae tribes in the southeast of England in the late Iron Age from around 125 BC. He describes in detail the importance of the arrival of these Belgae tribes. I can say clearly that without the Iron Age communities in Britain book, I would never have been able to write the Frisian Enigma. Finally, the fifth author of the five is Michael E. Jones. His book, The End of Roman Britain, makes it clear that the history of the Roman occupation of Britain that we were taught at school isn't really the truth. It's a brilliant work that I read from cover to cover in a couple of days, almost without putting it down. These were the works that started me writing my book, but as we go forward you will see there are many other books and historical documents that become almost as important as these first five. In the last few years, there has been a lot of doubts being raised concerning the accepted British history for the period of the Anglo-Saxon invasions. The accepted historical orthodoxy for this period, as it is found in textbooks, and as it is taught in schools and university, is on the brink of collapse. The five authors that I listed all get tantalisingly close to invalidating the existing version of history for the period of the Anglo-Saxon invasions, and even earlier back to the late Stone Age. Having read the groundbreaking works by these five authors, something intrigued me. After further research and a number of field trips, I came to the conclusion that they missed one very salient point about this period in British history. What I propose, and this is really the light motive of this book, is that the Belgae tribes that migrated or invaded England from 125 BC were Germanic speakers, or more correctly, they spoke diverse Teutonic languages, and they were not Gaelic speakers. History shows us that Belgae tribes had already been in the southern and eastern parts of Britain for 70 years or so before Caesar raided Britain in 54 and 55 BC. We will see that these Belgae tribes were direct descendants of a migration five to six hundred years previously from the Scandinavian peninsula and modern-day Denmark. They weren't Gaelic-speaking Celtic tribes of the Haustat Tene culture, as almost every history book indicates. Here are some cartographic examples of the assumption that the Belgae tribes were Gaelic-speaking Celts. For me, this is a fundamental misconception of British history for this period. If, as I conjecture and as I believe prove conclusively, the Belgae tribes spoke Teutonic languages, this fundamentally changes everything about English history. I make it clear right from the beginning that I am not a professor of history, and I have no degree in history whatsoever. My master's degree is actually in business studies from a French business school, but I am an avid amateur historian, and history has always been for me a consuming passion. I spent about half my life in England and half in France. Being bilingual helped me enormously in my research for this book. But before all that heady stuff, let's head back to Roman, pronounced Rumu. I returned to the island 26 years after first visiting it. In my recollection, it was a wondrous place and I wanted to refresh and confirm that old memory. After over a quarter of a century, I found that Rumu is still a spectacular and very special place. This island is one of the northernmost in a chain of islands that are the outer limits of the Wadden Sea. We say mudflat sea in English. They are called the Frisian Islands. This archipelago stretches along the coast from the West Netherlands through northwestern Germany and up to the Danish part of the ancient province of Schleswig. But you may well ask, what have the Frisian Islands and Rumu to do with British history? The Frisian Islands above all the Frisian people are, I believe, much more involved 
in the creation of the country of England than is admitted today by British historians. When I visited the only general store on the island of Rumu, I heard people speaking a language that was neither Danish nor German. It sounded like English, but the words were mostly different. However, some were easily identifiable. I was sure at one point that I heard, where is it cheese? But in a strange accent, but so almost English that it shocked me. When I asked the people what language they were speaking, they explained to me in perfect English that they were speaking Frisian. One said, it's easy for you English to prat and frisk. I looked confused and he said, you know, prattle on in Frisian. It troubled me that a language which I'd never heard of before sounded so very much like English, my own mother tongue. We spent a marvellous week on Rumu in the June of 2009. Walking, getting sunburn, eating raw herring and drinking the local Fogel Sang beer. We had marvelled at the stunning dunes and the enormous beaches. But in my mind, after the encounter in the store, I was quite perturbed. Something about our history was very wrong. When I got back home, I researched the Frisian language and Frisian history, and I was really quite surprised to learn that half a million people still speak the Frisian language today. After all, in none of the history books I've read are the Frisians mentioned as being a constituent part in the creation of England, and even when they do appear in more modern books, they are still very low in the pecking order. I couldn't work out why this language should sound so much more like English than modern German does. After all, we are Anglo-Saxons, aren't we? Well, apparently not. This then was the starting point for my long journey and the beginning of this book. My research has shown me that we have been aware since the 17th century that English is a Frisian language. And yet, pick up any history book in the world and it will tell you English is an Anglo-Saxon language. It's just plain false. Fake news, as we would say today. My first reflection was, if they faked this part of British history, how much more of the rest of it is false? Within a year, I knew that almost all of accepted British history, from the Belga invasions and subsequent migrations until the end of the Dark Ages, is mostly very, very wrong. My research has shown me that large-scale Anglo-Saxon Jewish invasions and migrations never happened. There are many clues that this is the case. The difficult logistics. Anglo-Saxon is not spoken in Britain today. And finally, it is proven today that hardly any Anglo-Saxon genes are to be found in the modern English people. Sorting out what really happened took me another four years. The result is the Frisian enigma, which, as we will see, is a very, very different view of the history of Dark Age England. I do apologise in advance for my style. It may appear that I jump around and go off at tangents. The reason I do this is that I'm always looking for additional clues that may be found through looking at things in a different way. Discovering that English was a Frisian language happened by pure chance, as did the next idea that the Belge tribes were Teutonic speakers. This came about, as you will see, through a chance discovery when I was researching a very different subject. So bear with me. I do get the cow over the pail eventually, and when you see the journey I have taken to get to my conclusion, you will understand better my reasoning. Well, that brings us to the end of the introduction. I know in advance the great problems I'm going to have getting my theories accepted by the historical establishment. I just have to look at my pile of Saxon this and Saxon that books to know this ain't going to be easy. But I'm not Anglo-Saxon. Saxon, call me the freezer man. Call me the freezer.